We return to the struggle in Egypt. With us now from our London bureau, Majid Nawaz, a former Islamist who fought against the Mubarak regime and spent four years in an Egyptian prison. Majid has since renounced extremism and formed the anti-extremist Killiam Foundation. Majid, you know the people behind the Egyptian uprising. You were in prison with some of these people. Now, many of these folks are radicals, if not extremists. Let me ask you this question. Do they really want a democratic government? Well, actually, the people I was in prison with represented the cross spectrum of all uh, the different views. So they were the leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood, in fact, their current global leader, and he is uh, an Islamist, as is the group. He was my cellmate. But also on the other end, uh, the former presidential candidate, the, the liberal Ayman Noor, uh, who's part of the 10 man opposition committee at the moment, he was my cellmate. Um, as was Saad Adin Ibrahim, who's a famous uh, Egyptian sociologist who's now based in the States in exile. So I think there was a cross spectrum. Now, the, the key thing with this uprising is that it is and it has been a spontaneous spontaneous people's uprising and the Islamists have not been involved from the beginning. They weren't the instigators. They're just coming in now, uh, late off the start, and are trying to get involved now. So I think it, there is some, uh, I think we can rest assured that, that, that this uprising was actually started by young people who are pro-democracy uh, and who want to see a free and fair uh, elections to elect their own president and want to see a democratic Egypt. So, Majid, when does the Muslim Brotherhood, when do the Islamists start playing their cards more forcefully and how do they do it? I, I actually have been speaking to people across the political spectrum who are on the ground in Egypt and uh, many of them my former cellmates and they tell me that the Muslim Brotherhood's official policy is that they recognize that they are unable to hijack this revolution. Reason number one, they don't have a Khomeini-like figure in Egypt. Uh, Khomeini, if, if we remember, was the man who hijacked the Iranian leftist re revolution and, and that's what led to be the, the creation of the Islamic Republic of Iran that we see today. The Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt don't have that. Their current global leader is an octopus he's in his 80s, as Mubarak is. And this is a young people's revolution. This is a new Egypt revolution. And this is the Egyptian youth saying to the world that we've had enough of old Egypt. So the first thing is that the Muslim Brotherhood simply don't have that unifying figure, the form of Baradai or Ayman Noor or Amr Musa or any of the other leading opposition figures who are Democrats that are emerging. There's no equivalent Islamist of that stature. Uh, and a second reason, I think, that the Muslim Brotherhood realized that that would actually jeopardize this uprising they know that the spotlight is on them. They know that the world is fearful of a brotherhood takeover. They know that, in fact, dictators in the Middle East have long used this binary of either us dictatorships or face Islamist extremists to hold off democracy in the Middle East. And so they know that this would play into the hands of Mubarak. And so they are stepping uh, aside. And I think that's quite a wise thing to do. Now, as what role ultimately will the army play? The army is the one today urging Egyptians to go back to their homes, to clear the streets. And is there any uh, alliance at all between the opposition figures and, and members of the armed forces? The opposition figures have said they'll be willing to negotiate with the vice president, who actually comes from an army background. He's the, he's the former head of the military intelligence, Omar Soleiman. And I think actually Omar Soleiman and people I've been speaking to or know him personally, um, they uh, are saying that he's a man who is able to actually uh, smooth a transition over to a democratically elected national unity coalition. Now, I think what Omar Soleiman needs to do, as the opposition have, have asked him, is that they will only begin negotiations with him after Mubarak steps down. Mubarak has in fact become a liability to Egypt. He's become a liability to the peace process and to Israel. He's become a liability to relations with the West. And he's become a liability to the old guard like Omar Soleiman because the longer Mubarak digs in his heels and stays the more angry the Egyptian people will become with Egypt's allies that's the West and uh, and Israel because they feel that their will is being thwarted by the stubbornness of one man who's had his day so I think it's in Omar Soleiman's interests to give Mubarak a slight nudge and begin negotiations with the opposition and I think he's a man who's able to deliver that Majid one quick question for you before we go the United States has propped up the Mubarak regime for close to three decades how does the opposition view America and how is that relationship likely to play out between the folks that you actually know personally? Well, uh, if the Democrats are in power and they're the ones who are spearheading this at the moment, then relations should be uh, relatively back to normal. Uh, and of course, Omar Soleiman won't just disappear. Once these negotiations start, and I hope they do, uh, after the, uh, Mubarak's moved on, Omar Soleiman, I, I would suggest, goes back to his role as uh, head of military intelligence. All right. And Imagine. I think then the relations will pretty much uh, normalize. Uh, the people I know are not anti-American uh, at all. 
All right, but it does sound as though that's still a big if. Majid, thanks so much for joining us. Majid Nawaz, he's a former Islamist, a former radical. He spent four years in an Egyptian prison. He knows many of the people who are behind the opposition movement in Egypt. He was with us from London this morning.